one of the things that epidemics do is to reveal the fault lines of the society that they affect and infect. We looked last time at Henry VIII and how he reacted when the sweating sickness came to London. Basically, he got the hell out of London as fast as he could, and so did all the rich courtiers and nobles, leaving the poor to their own devices or their own deaths. Class was a huge indicator of who died and who survived. And the same thing was true in England in the 1800s. And the story we're going to look at now concerns a frontline medical worker who tried to warn people about what was happening and wasn't listened to. And one of the reasons that he wasn't listened to, I think, was class again. He was working class. People didn't want to hear his message because of that. And his name was John Snow. And here he is, but no, not that John Snow. It's another, no, not that one either. Oh, try again. Right, thank you. Yes, John Snow, born in 1813 in Yorkshire, became one of the first ever epidemiologists and one of the first people to understand that cholera which was new to England in the 1830s, was waterborne. This was a terrifying disease. It could extremely quickly waste away sufferers and make their skin blue-tinged. So one of the names people gave it was the blue cholera. So what was it that made Snow better able to understand the causes of it than most of the medical establishment. I think being working class was his superpower. He was born outside York and christened here. He shared the insanitary living conditions of working class people. His dad was a coal yard labourer, so the family were poor. This gave him a great insight into disease. The rivers around York, as throughout the country at the time, were incredibly polluted, not least with the runoff from cemeteries, yes, really, which were then bottled and sold by water companies. Lovely. Snow was a brilliant pupil and became a medical apprentice at the age of 14. By just 19 years old, he found himself treating patients in his first cholera epidemic. We can see that he was starting to reach conclusions by the fact that people noticed about him and thought it was rather eccentric that he would only drink distilled water. Very sensible. But because this wasn't generally understood, the clothes of the dead, people who died of cholera, were typically washed in the river or stream that was the water source. Because we didn't understand the causes of cholera, good old English decided to be racist about it instead. The original ship that docked in Sunderland bearing cholera-infected sailors had come from India, so we decided to basically blame the Indians for it. Snow, meanwhile, moved to London to complete his medical training, enrolling at the Hunterian School. After he qualified as a doctor, he began working at the Westminster Hospital. And there, again, his insight proved extremely valuable. He noticed that medical students working in the dissecting room at the Westminster Hospital were passing out a lot. Well, you might think that was not surprising, but it wasn't just because of the nature of the work they were doing there. Snow traced it to the corpses being embalmed in arsenic. The Victorians loved arsenic. It produced a particularly pretty green dye that they liked and used in everything from dresses to wallpaper. Snow managed to persuade the hospital to stop using it in embalming and the illness stopped. He set up a family practice amongst 
poor people in London. And he noticed how much his patients, the women patients, were suffering because of repeated childbirth. Here's an idealised example of Victorian childbirth, but it was not like that for the women that he treated. With an average of 10 live births per adult woman, they were suffering, their health was suffering, and the pain was excruciating. Snow experimented with anaesthesia, but this was really controversial, so he needed a celebrity client to make it respectable. Step forward, Queen Victoria. He attended her in the birth of two of her children. This made his name. He could have rested on his laurels, but he hadn't forgotten about cholera. He was still trying to get people to listen to his idea about its waterborne nature. People wouldn't. And I think one of the reasons for this is contained in a description I found of somebody listening to one of his lectures where they said his voice was strange, it was gruff. I think they meant it was Yorkshire and working class. Snow lived in and around Soho when he was in London and so he was at the centre of a huge outbreak there in 1854. Quickly, anyone who had the money to do so fled out of the area leaving the poorest behind. We know the outbreak was horrendous. We have accounts of death after death. And one of the accounts we have was from a young nurse at a nearby hospital who told us she had to work three days non-stop without any breaks, with patient after patient being brought to her and many quickly, sadly, passing away. And her name was Florence Nightingale. Snow did what no one else had done. He went into the outbreak instead of away from it. He talked to the relatives of the dead. He pieced together the life stories, little biographies of those who had died. And very quickly, he realised that all the deceased had had their water from one communal water pump in Broad Street. Even the deaths who hadn't been close to that pump had sent to Broad Street for their water because they preferred the taste he found. He went straight to the Board of Guardians of the area and presented his findings and urged them to act quickly so that more people didn't die. He was so persuasive, accent notwithstanding, that the next day the handle was taken off the Broad Street pump. The epidemic slowed and stopped from that point onwards. Snow, sadly, only lived for four years after the end of that epidemic. He didn't die of cholera, but he did die of a stroke, perhaps brought on by overwork. He absolutely dedicated himself to his profession. He is remembered, although I don't think quite as much as he should be. But one of the honours that may or may not have delighted him was having a pub named after him in Soho. And the John Snow pub is still there now, very close to Broad Street. But Snow was a teetotaler. He would probably be happier with the John Snow Society that meets every year by the replica of the Broad Street pump for an annual lecture. What can we learn from this story? That we should always listen to those on the front line, our frontline healthcare workers, like the whistleblower in Wuhan, who again sadly wasn't listened to, like all the people who have died in the UK, many of whom have tried to tell us about the inadequate PPE they've been forced to work with. We should listen to them when they tell us that they don't go to work to die, and no one should. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back soon, and if you want to know exactly when, subscribe for notifications. Thank you.